Welcome to the opening event in the year of the Center for Advanced Study Initiative, Immigration, History, and Policy. Jim Barrett, Professor of History, and I, Gail Summerfield, uh, Professor in, in Human and Community Development and Director of Women and Gender and Global Perspectives Program, are co-chairing this initiative, and we're very happy to have you here today for our first speaker of the year, Alejandra Portes. We're using this initiative to broaden the discussion of migration and immigration issues on our campus and explore implications for our society and our own lives. Uh, we have a number of speakers and events that address a wide variety of topics in different global contexts and um, different levels of issues in society. But these are just the beginning for all the possible topics we could begin to have. And we look forward to seeing the way that people like you will be extending the discussion on campus. So um, today, uh, we're going to keep this very short. The provost was going to come in to introduce Professor Portes today, but unfortunately, she had to stay longer at the Board of Trustees meeting. And she just sends her greetings and encourages uh, She's very happy that we're looking at this initiative. Since she herself is an immigrant, she's had to face a lot of these issues that we'll be discussing during this initiative. The next event in this is Enchiladas, Dim Sum, and Apple Pie, Immigration and Food on September 24th at 4 p.m. at Levis. And we have Chancellor Herman and a group of scholars, a small group of scholars, including Jorge Chapa, Amy Gaida, and Martin Manalanson, and it'll be followed by a reception with food from representing different country appetizers because food has played such a large role in the culture of many immigrant people. Uh, and then on October 7th, we have Nancy Foner uh, coming in. That's just a taste of the different events that we're having for this year. Uh, I would like to thank the Center for Advanced Study for making this possible, and now have Jillian Stevens Professor of Sociology, introduce Professor Portes. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. It's an honor today to introduce Professor Portes, the Harrison and Beck Professor of Sociology at Princeton University. But I have to point out, in some ways, it's unnecessary to introduce him. Be to begin with, he's been here before. In fact, he started his career here as an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology. More recently, he gave the Florian Zanecki Lecture in the Department of Sociology just a year and a half ago. Um, just one of the many examples, or excuse me, just one example of the many lectures that he has given around the country. It's also unnecessary to introduce Professor Portes because I'm sure that all of you have seen his work. Here are some of the I say you've seen some of his work, and I use the word some very deliberately. It's difficult to keep up with Professor Porte's work because he is such a prolific scholar, and therefore it's hard to, to keep abreast of everything. But it is worthwhile to at least attempt to try to keep up with his work because of the numerous awards that attest to the quality of his work. I'd like to point out that he's won awards from not just from sociology associations, but also from some neighboring social science associations as well. As his career has proceeded, the regard that his work is held with has resulted in numerous very prestigious awards, such as honorary doctorates. He's also been appointed as the president of the American Sociological Association and has been elected to the National Academy of Science. So I'd like to end this short introduction by welcoming one of the best and most well-known scholars in sociology. I would like to point out, however, that I am particularly pleased that Professor Portes is developing a habit of returning to Illinois 
and giving us lectures on his most recent work. Uh, apparently, this is turning into a, a regular annual routine. Who was going to say 25 years ago that, uh, and indeed, um, the city and the university have changed a great deal. Can you hear me in the back? Okay. Um, generally, um, when we discuss international migration these days, we are concerned with what happens in the receiving countries. That is, what is the impact of migration for the receiving societies and so on. And I, a good part of my work has to do with that, with the second generation and so on. But today, this afternoon, I'd like to turn the tables and, uh, and focus not on the receiving, but on the sending societies. That is, what is the relationship between international migration and the prospects for change and development in the countries from which the migrants um, come from. So, uh, let's begin with two contradictory statements. This declaration was signed in the city of Cuernavaca in Mexico in 2005 by a large group of third world scholars. And as you can see, it says that the development model adopted in the immense majority of labor expo exporting countries has not generated opportunities for growth, nor economic or social development. On the contrary, it has meant the emergence of regressive dynamics on employment, job precarization, greater inequalities, loss of qualified workers, productive disarticulation and stagnation, infl inflation and greater dependency. As a consequence, we experience a, po a convergence between depopulation and the abandonment of productive activities in areas of high immigration. Cannot make it clearer than that. In terms of, and this is not the statement of a single scholar, but a declaration signed in Cuernavaca by all these people. Then we get uh, another statement by my colleague Douglas Massey and others who say exactly the opposite. Uh, this is one important reason for the pessimism that characterizes most studies is the lack of a good theoretical yardstick to measure the effects of immigration on economic growth. Village studies universally confuse consumption with a non-productive use of remittances, ignoring the extensive and potentially large economic linkages that remittances create in local economies. They also tend to confound remittances use with the effect of remittances on family expenditures. And many studies employ a rather limited definition of productive investments, restricting them to investments in equipment, while ignoring productive spending in livestock, schooling, housing, and land. Therefore, migration is good for development and, and for the, and, and for the con communities and countries that came in, and to sort of, uh, sort of clinch that point, you have this uh, pithy, strong statement for, from a young Salvadorian sociologist that said, forget about the IMF and the World Bank adjustment programs. Migration and remittances are the true economic adjustment program of the poor in our country. That's what really works. So how do we reconcile these seemingly contradictory statements about what migration, international migration, and labor migration in particular, does to sending countries? The, indeed, the study uh, of international migration and development, this field has been racked by the controversy between perspectives that see the outflow of people not only as a symptom of underdevelopment, but also as a cause of its perpetuation, versus those that regard migration both as a short-term safety valve and as a potential long-term instrument for sustained growth. The disjuncture has also disciplinary overtures, with sociologists and anthropologists most often found in the pessimistic camp and economists, especially neoclassical ones, and those guided by what is called the new economics of migration, supporting a much more optimistic assessment of the effects of migration. So what I try to do in this uh, analysis is to seek a possible reconciliation between these contrary positions. And to do that, we may consider first a set of assumptions and conclusions about the consequences of migration today that seem to be consensual that is agreed upon by scholars from different perspectives. First, the move ahead 
The move abroad is economically beneficial for most migrants, otherwise they would not undertake the journey. That's obvious. Second, the flow is welcome and often demanded by employers in the receiving countries who need and may come to depend on migrant labor. Third, the philanthropic contributions made by transnational migrant organizations help local communities and commonly provide them with services and infrastructures that otherwise they would not have. And fourth, at the national level, remittances from major labor exporting countries acquire really national structural importance as a key source of foreign exchange for descending countries. All positives and all, all consensual agreed upon by supporters of different points of view. But on the other hand, you have these other consensual points as well. First, and this I like to emphasize this, there is no known inst instance of remittances economically developing by themselves any labor exporting country. It has never happened. Uh, it could contribute to this, but there is no, con no example of a country being developed, moving to the advanced world on the basis of the remittances of their expatriates. And that's an important point. Second, migrant investments in direct productive activities in their home countries have at best a modest effect on national economic growth. Third, while the multiplier effects of migrant remittances can be considerable, they are countermanded, countermanded by the cumulative character of migration that can lead to depopulation. Uh, I'll emphasize that time again, to depopulation in the sending areas. And lastly, migration may decelerate active efforts by sending country governments to promote autonomous national development because it provides a cushion. It allows a entrenched elite in these countries to maintain things as they are, a, in a sense, uh, lying back or relying on the, con on the, con on the contributions of hardworking migrants abroad that bring a flow of foreign exchange into these countries of remittance, thereby alleviating domestic scarcities and removing the onus of responsibility from local and national governments in sending areas. Less universally recognized, but backed by considerable empirical evidence, are the following last two points. When migrants bring their families with them, the process of the population accelerates as return migration becomes less probable. Uh, when people come and bring their, their spouses and children, there is, very, there is much less incentive to go back. And when labor migrants bring their families with them, they foster the growth of a second generation, that is children of immigrants, in receiving countries that grow up in conditions of severe disadvantage. Something that connects with the literature on the second generation, as we will see. There are key factors leading to alternative outcomes of international migration. These have to do, and I will go over these factors with you, first with the behavior of the migrants themselves, second with the behavior of governments in sending and receiving sessions, nations, and third with the passage of time. First, the migrant population has to be differentiated between the flow of manual, low-skilled labor and the movement of highly trained professionals and technical personnel. For brevity, these are two, two flows occurring at the same time at both ends of the labor market. For brevity, the first flow may be referred to as labor migrants and the second as professional migrants. The behavior and the conduct of both flows over time are different, but as we are going to see, their potential to make a contribution for national and local development happens to depend on the same set of factors, despite their different human capital endowments. So we, we will consider each of them and, and then turn on the, an assessment of, of developmental effects of migration on sending and receiving nations. First, let's go over some, uh, I'd like to sh go over with you briefly what are the, the, the different key theoretical paradigms in this area that deal with the determinants of migration. Let's consider first the theoretical schools that, that try to explain labor migration, low, ca low human capital, manual labor migration. Um, neoclassical economic theory, which receives support from the universal wage differentials between labor expo exporting and labor receiving countries, 
which in the case of the Mexico-U.S. migratory system is at present seven to one for unskilled labor, meaning that a Mexican peasant can earn in an hour here what it would take him a day to earn back home. The limitations, however, of neoclassical theory have also been made evident by the fact that this wage differential operates very unevenly, leading to wide differences in the timing and the size of labor flows from within the same country and even from the same regions, operating at the same level of economic development. In effect, what happens is that the, neocla the neoclassical approach neglects the social context in which such individual calculations are made. People are not in a level playing field and sit with their calculator and see, well, how much am I going to make if I manage to cross the border and how expensive is that going to be, what probabilities, and then they add and subtract. If the addition comes right, then they all move. Um, well, if they don't move that way, that those, those things don't, ha ha don't happen that way because there is social context. There is a context uh, that, that, that wraps up and frames the calculations of individual people, and this context accounts for the varying awareness of wage differentials in potential regions of our migration. Some, play, some people are very aware of them, and some people do not have a clue of how to implement them. The meaning of that these differentials have also vary with the context and the availability of the means, the economic and social means, to act on them, to, that is to put them to use, which are very different with context. Absent these elements, wage differentials, no matter how large, do not translate themselves into sustained labor flows anywhere. So that's the, the limitation. The, most, the second theory, and the most optimistic, concerning this is what is called the new economics of migration that was, the, was pioneered by the Harvard economist Odette Stark and st strongly endorsed, among others, by my colleague Doug Massey at Princeton. This theory places emphasis on the concept of relative deprivation, said to affect non-migrant families when they compare their lot with those who have migrants abroad. It also singles out the non-existence or imperfection of credit, insurance, and future markets in rural areas of descending countries. So that from this view, migration is said to represent a form of self-insurance by rural families who use it as one of several strategies for economic survival. In the views of Stark, Massey, and others, the, the migrant going abroad is the, is the family's visa card. Uh, that is, there is no market, so it's the visa card and insurance program roll up into one walking person that actually provides the credit that they could not otherwise have. The positive effects of migration from this view come from its ability to compensate for market imperfections, allowing families to engage in productive activities. Even when remittances are spent in direct consumption, said Stark, they are said to generate indirect multiplier effects because they create new demand for locally produced goods. So you receive, the family receives the money, spends it, and it creates new demand for goods and services produced locally. So according to Massey, every additional migra dollar, as uh, they are called migra dollar, uh, sent to Mexico by migrants generates about $3 a $3 contribution to the Mexican gross national product in a spin-off multiplier effects. Superior to the rather unrealistic neoclassical approach of orthodox economics, this new economics perspective leaves open the question of how the early migrants who induce relative deprivation among their neighbors managed to go abroad in the first place and second, its optimistic, optimistic assessment of the economic effects of migration is questionable when the depopulation of the countryside makes it impossible to put migrants' remittances to productive use. If there is no one left, there is no structure, where are you going to put uh, those contributions to use? In that sense, the new economics may be seen as a, as a realistic but rather limited range approach applicable under certain macro-social <coughs> conditions but not others. Finally, at a higher level of abstractions, we find world systems and other neo-Marxist theories that view labor migration as a natural response to the penetration of weaker societies by the economic and political power of the developed world. The operating, operating concept here is called a structural imbalancing, and it was introduced to highlight how this process takes multiple forms. This penetration and imbalancing of sending societies from the direct recruitment of domestic workers to the diffusion of consumption expectations from the north to the south, bearing little relation to local lifestyles and economic means.
it's sel it is seldom noted that Mexican migration to the United States did not start spontaneously. It started by direct recruitment by, of, ra uh, of ranches and farmers who paid who sent paid recruiters to the interior of the Mexican Republic to bring in peasants to meet the labor need, the labor need of railroads and farms in the American Southwest. Once the flow was initiated by, pay, by these paid recruiters, um, in, in, the 19th, in the 19th and early 20th century, it became self-sustaining through the operation of the forces outlined by the new economics model. In other words, sentiments of relative deprivation were reinforced in the interior of Mexico by the increasing penetration of the Mexican countryside that what it did was to diffuse new consumption expectations, new standards uh, among the mass of the population which locally had no means to gain access to them and which saw their neighbors who had gone north gain access to some of these goods. As the Mexican sociologist Raúl Delgado Weiss has recently noted, this process of a structural imbalancing reaches culmination with the signing of NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, that in effect, as we can see with the benefit of hindsight after 10 years, limit greatly reduced the autonomy of the Mexican state to implement national economic initiatives or protect domestic enterprise, turning the country in effect into a giant labor reservoir for U.S. industry and agriculture, which is at present the main role of the Mexican uh, political economy in the world. As a historical concept, a structural imbalancing in the center periphery system does not seek to account for the dynamics of migration from a particular locality or region, but to provide the necessary theoretical framework to understand the very broad forces that initiated and that sustained the movement over time. It is within a context of extensive social and economic penetration of weaker societies by the institutions of advanced capitalism that individual cost-benefit calculations make sense and can be implemented, uh, or, or that the emergence of relative deprivation as a motiva motivator for out-migration comes about. In essence, what happens is that migration moving north resolves the inescapable contradictions between the undermining of local autonomy and the increasing diffusion of new consumption expectations in weaker nations without the parallel diffusion of the economic means to gain access to them. Migration is a way of solving uh, this gap. And then comes the fourth perspective, which is not macro, but meso. That is, it, it, comes, it tries to explain not how migration is initiated, but how it continues over time. Regardless of the various perspectives on the origins of labor migration, all contemporary scholarship converges on the concept of social networks as a key factor sustaining it over time. Social networks link not only migrants with their kin and communities in sending countries, they also link the employers in receiving areas to migrants. These ties, these networks, underlie the emergence of such phenomena as chain migration, one, migrant, one family coming after another, long distance referral systems to fill job vac vacancies in the receiving countries so that restaurants, farms, and so on do not have to advertise in the local newspaper. They just call one of their local migrant workers and say, hey, we have a, an opening or several here. Why don't you contact your kin or family or relatives at home? and they show up in a relatively short period of time, and the organization of a dependable flow of remittances back to sending communities. And at later stages, these networks are also the key factors in the consolidation of what we know today in the field of immigration as transnational organizations that endow migrant populations with increasing voice in the affairs of their localities and even the countries of origins. Let me make a stop here to show you a, a bit how these things operate. Uh, these are, um, uh, oops. Um, these, these are the dynamics in the sending countries as the, as the flow of migration begins and in the receiving as migrants uh, make significant investments to strengthen their organizations and as then you have transnational enterprises uh, and social activities begin and later periods as you can see, read, readily read by yourself so I don't have to read it eventually transnational communities are consolidated these are in a sense what happens here through social networks is that transnational communities is the expression of the fact 
that migrants do not forget those left behind. According to the, to the classic orthodox assimilation theory, migrants who come es escaping hunger and want leave and they basically want to join and move into, into the receiving society and leave whatever they left behind. That is empirically inaccurate. That never happens. Rather, migrants, once they come, they, uh, they do not forget, they do not leave, and they try to not only send remittances, which this accounts for the flow of remittances, but often create organizations. Organizations, political, economic, civic, and so on, that try to have a voice in sending countries to make philanthropic contributions to uh, develop civic communities. And of course, as the migrant, as the expatriate communities get more and more consolidated here, they have greater power and greater resources to do that there. And that happens with every migrant flow of any size occurring to the developed world today. It's not only in Mexico, I, we can now say that it's in Mexico, it's for Colombians, it's for Dominicans, and in Europe it's for Eritreans, it's for Turks, it's for Moroccans, and so on. So this is not uh, limited to Mexico, this is a relatively uh, generalized uh, phenomenon. So what is the role of social networks on to our initial question of development and the impact of well, it turns out that social networks can operate as a double-edged sword on the effects of migration on both community and national development. In fact, they underlie the optimistic pro prognosis of the, of the new economics of migration school concerning the resolution of local market deficiencies and other production bottlenecks, as well as the onset of indirect mul multiplier effects of remittances. But on the other hand, the progressive lo lowering of the cost of migrations that, that these networks make possible can lead, in the absence of countervailing forces, to severe depopulation of, the send, of sending towns and regions. In the end, if this process continues, because social networks is a cumulative process, it's path dependent, uh, there would be few people to send remittances to and no productive apparatus to be re-energized by migrant investments or increased local demand. So the cumulative effects of networks over time could lead in these circumstances to the desolate extremes that have been portrayed already by some ethnographic studies. Ghost towns, tinsel towns, adorned once a year for the patron saint's festivities, at, at which time the migrants return and populated the rest of the year only by the old and the infirm. Already, 50% of Mexican municipalities are, are, uh, are reported to have significantly lost population in the last intercensal period. Something important because people think that this migration is going to go on forever. Well, that's not, that's not going to be the case. The demographics of it make it impossible to continue forever when, in a sense, a, a great deal of, for, of sending communities are emptying and these towns are essentially decamping, moving from there and placing themselves here. The operation of social networks over time, hence lies at the core of the contradictory accounts of the effects of labor migration and development that we saw at the start of this talk. And the next logical question for us then is, what kind of networks lead to one outcome instead of the other? Or alternatively, under what conditions do they encourage sustained growth in places of origin versus demographic implosion and depopulation? The answer to that question seems to me to, ha to hinge on two key factors. First, governmental intervention, and second, the character of migration itself. And let me work briefly with you through each of you the, because they are the factors that decide between one or another of the effects of social networks. Governmental action. Effective governmental programs in sending countries in the form of public works, subsidies and support of productive activities, the direct launching of employment creating enterprises can make a great deal of difference. Of course, that requires an active and dynamic government at the, at the national and local level. In those cases, by motivating productive age adults to stay and work, they create the necessary socio-demographic infrastructure for the migrants to invest back, because there are some people where, uh, and some structures where these investments can be productively used. 
Even when some of the families choose to leave off remittances, the demands for, the, for goods and services that they generate can be met by other working adults in the community and region, merchants, farmers, construction crews, that does generate the spin-off effects uh, predicted by the new economics school. That is, this is a way in which the micro dollars provide a multiplier effects. But more important, as important as the, the role of the government is the character of migration itself. When the flow is composed of young adults who travel abroad for temporary periods and return home after accumulating enough savings, the direct and indirect positive effects that, we have, that are described by uh, Stark and others have every chance to materialize. On the other hand, when migration is formed by entire families, uh, the cumulative depopulating effect of migration are much more likely. Entire families, to repeat, seldom return. And migrant workers have less incentives over time to send large remittances or to make sizable investments in places of origins when their spouses and their children no longer live there. In a nutshell, cyclical labor migration can have positive developmental effects, especially at the community level. Permanent family migration does not, leading instead to the emptying of, of sending places. This is, according to all evidence, what has been happening in Mexico. The story of how the North American Free Trade Agreement hollowed out Mexican industry and has severely weakened peasant farming, farming the, 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 that is, uh, artisanal farming through cheap food imports and capital-intensive mechanized agriculture imported from the North have been torn, told in great detail by a number of Mexican scholars, including Delgado Weiss and his associates. The end of employment in a number of sectors of the Mexican economy and the severe reduction of opportunities for productive investment in the countryside has stimulated permanent family migration north, when in the past the flow was overwhelmingly cyclical, of a cyclical kind. Once established on this side of the border, there is little for migrant families to return to, and hence the alleged positive effects, if positive effects of migration on development tend to dissipate. Under these difficult conditions, I, there is one silver lining, one spot outside from what I've sort of defects of the population. The, the silver lining, the only bright spot, is the rise of transnational organizations created by the migrants abroad. Existing research has shown um, that participation in these cross-border initiatives does not decline, but actually grows with time in the first generation, during the first generation, because it is the better established and more economically secure immigrants who have the means and the motivation to do something for their hometowns. So in the, cross of the, the process is uh, participation in this organization has the effect, has the, uh, looks over time like an inverted U. It, is, it starts very slow when migrants have recently arrived and they are struggling to, make a, to establish a foothold. They don't have the resources. It grows over time as migrant communities uh, get consolidated and immigrants improve their economic and legal position in the country. So they reach high. And then they, de they tend to decline as that, as that first generation passes from the scene, being substituted by a second generation that in most cases is truly acculturated and therefore less, less committed to the fates and the conditions of their hometowns. In the case of Mexico in particular, where migration comes to a large extent from the countryside, is formed by peasants, uh, there had, there, these these, uh, these uh, rural workers have created literally hundreds of hometown committees in all the places where they have settled in the United States. These are called clubes de oriundos in Spanish. And uh, they proliferate. They, that is, five migrants from the same uh, hometown arrive there and you have a club. They, they would have it, there is, there is a kind of sending, that sense of loyalty to try to, to do things they, these clubs, these uh, com hometown committees have acquired such power and visibility as to become today interlocutors of, of the Mexican government and to acquire a frequently decisive significance in the hometown developments, in the, in the development prospects of their towns. Mexican governmental initiatives at the federal level in Mexico have culminated in the creation of the Institute for Mexicans Abroad in, 
IME in the Spanish acronym, and the launching of a very interesting program that other countries are now trying to imitate called the 341, the, three, the tres por uno, which means that every dollar contributed by these hometown committees for, uh, the develop, for public works in their, in their town or community is matched by three dollars. One from the Mexican federal government, one by the state, and one by the municipality. It's called Tres por Uno. It has been working rather well. It's a unique initiative reflecting this silver lining of, uh, of, uh, of the rise of this uh, transnational organization suspended, as it were, between two national uh, political economies. Migrant transnationalism can thus be understood, we can understand it as a form of a grassroots response to the inequalities and the economic difficulties that motivated their migration in the first place. We can see transnationalism, as it has been called in the literature, as a form of globalization from below uh, that countermands, at least in a partial way, the inequality deepening globalization from above that is promoted by the interests of corporate capitalism. It is in that context when one fully understands the implications of our young Salvadorian sociologists at the start of this talk. That is that migration and remittances are the true economic adjustment program of our communities. Transnationalism gives expression to the enduring concerns of migrants for kin and communities le left behind. I simply would like to point out that though they, they, are, while not, they are not sufficient to countermand the effects of the population, they at least provide a palliative about a, if abs, effect absent if migrants were to follow exclusively an assimilation path, if they were simply to cut off ties. So it's a palliative. It's, it does not completely overcome the, the, the demographic effects of the population, but it is there and it is operating right now in, a, in a, a, a linking communities, that is, large expatriate communities, both in the United States and Western Europe, with, with their uh, places of origin. Let me change the focus now to deal with professional migrants. Because demand from migrant labor in the developed world today is not limited to labor-intensive industries and sectors. In the U.S. in particular, sustained economic growth has led to a rise in demand at the other end of the spectrum during the last decades that is for professionals and technicians of high caliber. Technological booms like those that gave rise to Silicon Valley in California, Route 128 around Boston, the Research Triangle Park in North Carolina, have produced a sustained demand for well-trained engineers and gifted programmers. On more traditional sectors, there is a perennial scarcity of nurses, of general family practitioners, and of scientists in certain fields that has also been met by foreign trained professionals. The U.S. Congress recognized this demand as early as the 19, 1990, creating what is known as the H-1B visa program, under which highly skilled professionals could be hired for temporary work in the United States. The visa and work permits are issued for a maximum of three years, renewable for another three. In practice, many of these H-1B workers eventually shift their status to legal permanent residence. And the program, I can tell you, have been growing by leaps and bounds. Despite all you hear about the economy going down and so on, this is, this is a constant growth. In 1990, the authorized ceiling for this program was 65,000 temporary workers. The American Competitiveness and Workforce Improvement Act of 1998 increased to 115,000. In 2002, it was further increased to 195,000. In 2003, 361,000 H-1B permits to temporary workers with college degrees were issued, of which approximately half were renewals. And by 2006, the figure had surpassed 400,000. Principal, the principal specialty areas included our computer science, engineering, and information technologies. And the main sources of this professional inflow are mostly in the third world, countries at mid-levels of development with a well-developed uh, professional or scientific establishment, primarily overwhelmingly India, then in China, then Mexico, despite the fact of being Mexico is a major contributor to this, and Colombia, and then Canada, which is close by. 
Um, there is little doubt that the H-1B program has become the primary source of a flexible labor supply for the high-tech, highly skilled sectors of the U.S. economy. Let's see if I can find the table. Yeah. Oops. Uh, this table uh, gives you an idea of the top six industries uh, for which H-1B workers are coming. Uh, in more or less the, in 2002, the, uh, the Department of Homeland Security had, had stopped issuing this data for some reason. So that's the, the, last, uh, the, last, the last year for which we have, we have this detailed information of the countries they come from, of their salaries, uh, when they arrive or their degree of training and so on. We know the numbers, but this detailed information, they, are, they don't publish it anymore. This is known as the brain drain in places, in sending countries. And the determinants of this flow, of these professional flows have actually been analyzed in terms similar to labor migration and, with the same, and by the same theoretical schools. The individualistic cost-benefit framework of neoclassical economics finds support in the fact that professional migration commonly originate in poorer countries where the expected remunerations for professionals are but a fraction of what they can receive in the United States or other developed countries. But the theory is contradicted by the fact that it is not the poorest countries. It's not Burkina Faso. It's not, a, it's not uh, a Mauritania. It's not Bolivia that are the main sources of uh, high-tech professional migration here. Rather, they are mid-income countries that are the major sources of professional migration and that within these countries, there are great variations in the motivations and the probability for migrants to leave. Regardless of home country con conditions, most professionals in most of these countries do not leave. They remain at home. So migration is affect a minority of this population. You would say, well, they, they would all be leaving because of this. It doesn't happen. The majority for stay. Uh, it is a minority who migrate abroad, and generally they come from mid-income countries. It's China, it's India, uh, it's Mexico, it's not Bolivia, Haiti, or the poorer countries in, in, the, in Africa or Asia. A perspective similar to the new economics of migration would emphasize the relative deprivation of would-be migrant professionals in relation to two reference groups. First, well-situated professionals at home, and second, similarly trained professionals abroad. The first group uh, has acquired the wherewithal to practice their careers in relatively good conditions and to lead a, mid a middle class existence in their own country. In their, in their own country. The inability to meet that standard, just to live a middle class existence in, the, in, their, in their own country, becomes a powerful motivator for departure for professionals unable to reach it. In other words, for them, it is not the invidious comparison of salaries with those paid abroad, but the inability to access remunerations that make possible a decent lifestyle in their own countries that becomes the key determinant of the brain drain. Second, in relation to professionals abroad, the central source of relative deprivation is not salary differentials, but work conditions and opportunities for self-development. It is at this point that the third theoretical school that I mentioned before uh, it, it emphasized the theory of a structural imbalancing of peripheral societies becomes, becomes relevant because it highlights how diffusion of scientific innovations and modern professional practices from the global centers commonly lead to forms of training that bear little relationship to conditions of peripheral countries. Engineers and physicians in these countries are thus trained in the latest and most scientific ways of practicing their professions when the equipment and condition to put these skills into practice at home are generally absent. In that fashion, less developed nations end up spending scarce resources in educating personnel whose future potential for career development is situated abroad. They have to go abroad because they cannot find it there. This is the dynamic underlying what the concept of modernization for, immig for immigration. One of the key factors in the literature of the brain drain, modernization of the training system to emigrate abroad.
Um, you can see it there that is basically what happens is outlined in this figure. Uh, a, a, an, an ambitious mid-income country tries to be creating a scientific and professional personnel by importing the, the scientific innovations and training diffused from the centers. So the students in, in engineers, physicians, and are socialized in the professional practice and expectations congruent with those of the advanced world, that's why these are imported, while sustained growth in the, in, in the richer countries generates a, a demand for trained labor that cannot be met at present. Naturally, uh, when uh, they need to go, up, that is when they are looking for, to fill that demand for engineers, scientists and so on, where will they go? They would go to those countries that have trained that, that, that's why they go to Mexico, to India and China, and not to Haiti or Bolivia. Those are the countries that are capable of generating that demand, and professionals who are, fa who are faced there with or inability to access scarce opportunities at home, or for both uh, economic uh, remuneration and professional development, have every incentive to respond to these offers, and that's when the brain drain starts. That's sort of the cycle of modernization for immigration. The paradox that countries seeking to build a scientific and professional base often end up subsidizing the, the high-tech, high top labor needs of um, the richer economies. So, the classical literature on the brain drain describe it as an unmitigated disaster for peripheral countries whose scarce pools of professionals and scientific personnel were constantly siphoned off by the richer nations and whose painful efforts to create and expand cadres of domestic talent came to naught. Uh, however, again, uh, this dismal landscape has a silver lining. It doesn't end there. And actually, the same concept that I have come back and again plays a role here. In recent years, new evidence, along with the advent of the transnational perspective on immigration, has partially modified these rather glo uh, gloomy conclusions of the traditional brain drain literature. What happens? In an increasingly globalized system, Ever-growing innovations in transportation and communication technologies greatly facilitate contact across international borders. If that is the case for poor migrant workers at the bottom of the labor market, how much more so among professionals whose economic resources and level, levels of information are significantly greater? The same empirical literature on determinants of participation in transnational organizations that I mentioned earlier uncovered the fact that higher education and higher occupational status have positive and significant effects on the probability of migrants here engaging in the various forms of transnational activism that is economic, political, and civic. This is uh, an analysis, a, a multivariate analysis of determinants of engagement, of engaging in transnational organizations by Latin immigrants coming to the United States, both economic and political. And I want to point out simply that, for example, a, um, a high school degree increases. These are negative binomial regression coefficients converted into net probabilities. And net of other variables, a high school degree increases the probability of engaging in these activities by 173%, that's a whopping amount, and a college degree by an additional 38%. In addition, notice that U.S. citizenship, acquisition of U.S. citizenship has partic no particular effect on this and actually increases this form of transnationalism, while years of residence in the U.S. increases in the first generation the likelihood of engaging in economic and political activities rather than decreasing it, contrary to a orthodox assimilation perspective. It's as if people don't forget, and they not only don't forget that when their situation becomes better, as it will become with years in the country, every additional year of life in the U.S. increases the probability of engaging in these activities by 3%, net of other factors. So it's the more educated, the better settled, the more secure, the ones that are here that are more likely in the first generation to engage 
in, this, in, in these activities, and of course, professionals are at the top of the pile. They are the ones who have the degrees and, the, the, and so on. So what we are finding in this analysis is that they are the most likely, the better educated, to engage in these kinds of activities back home. And intuitively, if you think of it, these findings make sense. In addition to national loyalties and the weight of nostalgia over time, migrant professionals commonly have a sense of obligation to the institutions that educated them back home when on the basis of the education that they receive in their countries, they achieve wealth, security, and status abroad, it is only natural that many seek to repay the debt. Some do so through philanthropic activities, others through transferring information and technologies, still others through sponsoring the training of younger colleagues at home. Professionals who have become su successful entrepreneurs may go further and endow their alma maters or even found institutions of higher learning and research at home. As the case of India exemplifies, the growth of sizable, a sizable population of professionals, engineers, and scientists abroad has not necessarily led to the hollowing out of home country institutions, but may actually energize them through a dense transnational traffic of personnel, of resources, and of, of an ideas. The positive, so in that sense, today, the more recent studies that we have, is that the growth of, of, uh, of high-tech growth poles in countries like uh, India and China have depended overwhelmingly on the activity of their migrants abroad, on this transnational flood. It had been Silicon Valley Indian and Chinese entrepreneurs that account to a large extent for what Bangalore has become in India or what Shanghai Shanghai has become in China, that is centers of significant, train, significant IT uh, development and expansion and the creation, the autonomous creation of new technology. How that is, so how does that happen? When is this flow positive or negative? When do you, we have brain drain and when do we have Bangalore's uh, growing this? The positive or negative effects of professional immigration and development depend exactly on the same two factors that we saw for manual labor migration. The, first, the action of home country governments, and second, the character of migration. Concerning the first, the creation of centers of higher learning, the support for research projects, and the financial initiatives for establishment of high-tech private industry provides the necessary infrastructure at home to receive and to absorb what the prof migrant professionals have to contribute. That is, you need to have that infrastructure. So that for migrants, professionals, to be able to make economic, scientific, and, and technological transfer home, there has to be institutions capable of receiving and benefiting for su from such contributions. Otherwise, despite good intentions, migrants can at best make fund charity projects that do not further the scientific or the technological development of their countries. That is the difference between an India and a Bolivia. Uh, when there is no infrastructure at home, you can do philanthropy, but there is no way of transferring and building uh, on a scientific base. India exemplifies the ways that the country can benefit from a large-scale professional migration. While the country continues to export thousands of engineers and computer scientists, the institutions that train them continue to exist and flourish with a strong government support. Protected national industry also generates technological development and creates new em employment opportunities for returnees. Dense international networks give scientists and engineers on temporary visas abroad something to go back to. It also lays the groundwork for the transnational activities of those permanently settled in North America, Europe, or Australia who wish to contribute to India's scientific development or even to establish new enterprises there. Second, the character of migration also bear on the development potential of these professional communities abroad. When the movement is cyclical, that is with temporary journeys abroad followed by return to permanent positions at home, the technology transfer potential of migration is increased. Return professional and scientists can immediately put to use what they have learned abroad. In that sense, the US H-1B program represents a welcome development. 
There is no doubt, and I have no doubt, that it was not implemented for that reason. It was implemented to increase the flexibility of American corporations to hire and fire and occupy and keep those who they want or not, so it keep it flexible. But actually, it has the unexpected effect that is positive in the sense of encouraging return migration on a cyclical basis. But here, there is a difference between labor migration and professional migration concerning a permanent displacement abroad. I mentioned before that permanent out-migration from the countryside, as in Mexico, is, is a rather, has a rather negative effect on development prospects of, sending, of the sending country and, and communities. Contrary to that, it turns out that permanent professional migration does not necessarily have negative consequences for the sending country for these reasons. First, the departure of professionals does not depopulate the countryside. There are very few to begin with, so they don't depopulate anything. Mostly come from cities, and this is not a massive inflow as that of labor migration from the countryside. Second, although professionals abroad may be permanent residents and, even may, and may even become citizens of the receiving countries, they can make the process cyclical themselves. They can make the process cyclical themselves by using their economic resources and their know-how for regular transfers to their home country and for sizable investments or programmatic activities there. Unlike labor migrants whose cross-border contributions yield at best modest philanthropic projects and hometown public infrastructure, professional transnationalism has the potential to alter significantly the levels of scientific expertise and technological know-how in the home countries. And this is indeed what is happening now. Many of these migrants live in two places at the same time. They can stay here, they may carry two passports, uh, they, can have a, they can commute across the Pacific or sometimes across the Atlantic. They can make investments there, as had happened with many successful professional uh, migrants uh, from uh, a number of sending countries when the opportunities exist at home. So again, to repeat and this conclude, whether, tempora so whether temporary professional migrants in fact return and whether established professional migrants abroad continue to invest seriously in transnational activities for scientific and technological development depends ultimately on the first condition stipulated before. There must be something to return to. As, there, as the remittances and the investments of labor immigrants lack any developmental potential when their hometowns become tinsel towns, the contributions that professional communities abroad can make evaporate when there is no institutional structure, no network of national high-tech industries that can receive those contributions and put them to use. To conclude, theories of national development in Latin America and elsewhere have seldom paid atten much attention to international migration in the past. At best, these flows in the past were treated as a marginal phenomenon, a reflection of the problems of underdevelopment. No longer. The size of expatriate communities and the volume of the remittances that they send home have prompted a reorientation of theoretical models where these massive resources play center stage. For some authors, remittances, for some authors in the development literature, remittances can have a key role in resolving past financial bottlenecks and furnishing the necessary resources for long-term development. I am less, that is, I would argue that these rosy predictions are exaggerated. As I mentioned before, no country has been developed by the remittances of its expatriates. There is no precedent that, that any country had taken that road. And more importantly, the positive effects of these contributions are contingent on other factors, as we have seen. Depending on these factors, migration can lead to vastly different consequences, to economic stagnation, to the emptying of sending places and the massive loss of talent from the professional pool versus the energizing of local communities, new productive activities, and significant contributions for scientific and technological development. As I mentioned, just to, restart, is to emphasize the point, 
Professional migration need not be formally cyclical to become so in practice. For reasons that we have already seen, migrant professionals common, commonly have the necessary motivation and resources to engage in transnational activities in favor of their home country institutions. And as the case of India, of Taiwan, China, and other major sources of professional migrants to the US and Europe attest, these activities can often, have major, can often make major contributions to the scientific and technological development of their home nations. In this area, as in all others pertaining to national development, the role of the home state is decisive. The positive relationship between migration and development is not automatic. Market forces alone will not establish this connection. The proactive intervention of the state to create productive infrastructure in rural areas and scientific technological institutions capable of innovation are necessary conditions for the development potential of migration to actualize. Countries that simply open their borders, hoping that the magic of the market will play the key role and will, and, and will, it will lead to development will not reap these benefits. The contrasting experiences of countries that have followed that path, like Mexico, versus those have taken a proactive stance toward their expatriate communities and their economic scientific potential provide, provide a clear lesson of, uh, of this trend for the future. And lastly, there is increasing talk today, in both in Western Europe and in the US, to return actually to a system of temporary labor migration aim at restoring the circularity of the flow at the bottom. That is, this is um, um, migrant workers' labor. For all the reasons that we have seen, these proposals get it. But they get it half. They get it only half right. Uh, that's fine, generally. The other half of the equation, if you want to restore, if you want to create, restore cyclicality and restore and create a problem of circular labor migration, is devising incentives for migrants to return voluntarily. These incentives might be individual in the forms of monetary bonuses. By themselves, these incentives will not work. Will, will not work. It will be necessary to devise collective incentives in the form of investments in the regions and localities of our migration that provide a reason for migrants both to want to keep their families there and to return themselves after a period abroad. Those investments should be directed at public infrastructure, education, and health. The government of the receiving countries here of the global north that benefits so much from the, lab from the labor of migrants should establish cooperative arrangements with countries and regions of out-migration out in order to develop these uh, temporary programs. If properly done, these investment programs will have the added effect of reducing migratory pressures by making life conditions at home more, toler more tolerable. Just as a free market laissez-faire stance will not work in linking migration and development, a forced coercive program of return will not work as migrants have been proven time and again to find myriad ways to circumvent those rules. A proactive labor management program involving governments at both ends of the migration stream and providing meaningful collective incentives for return is the right solution in the present context and the one that we must strive for. Thank you very much. Waiting for the mic. Why is uh, why is high school graduation a major factor in Mexican in Mexican migration? I've spoken to Santiago Levy, who's like the creator of Progresa and Oportunidades, and he said that that uh, that program was actually the biggest cause of increased migration. So he, he actually thought that too. Mm -hmm. But but why why is there such a big link between them? Between between high, high school graduation and high, uh, high school graduation rates and migration. Okay. Um, are there other questions? I'd like to take two or three, if possible, and, and sort of respond to them. 
What examples of um, created infra infrastructure or other means to motivate labor migrants, whether it's a domestic workers, I don't know if Indonesia or Philippines have done anything of, of that sort, but are there any examples of infrastructure that has been created for labor migrants? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wonder to what extent Mexico is, to some extent, a victim of its location. Uh, India and China exported uh, very poorly trained workers for many, many generations, mm -hmm. but they somehow managed to turn. Brazil probably would have looked very much like Mexico 40 years ago and clearly has taken a different path. Mm -hmm. So is, is, is the location of Mexico a particular handicap for them to overcome? In lo the location, a particular handicap for? For, for a successful return mm. migration policy. Okay. Or, yeah, last one, fourth. I would uh, appreciate if you could elaborate um, the implications of what a uh, rational policy of migration between the United States and Mexico would uh, look, look like. I mean, you have some really good ideas. I'd like to know if you could uh, be a little bit more specific. I'm sorry, could you elaborate? <laughs> well, so, so what should the next president do, the next president of the United States and the president of Mexico do to follow up on your uh, okay. policy recommendations? Okay, oh, that's enough <laughs> for, for a while. We'll take a second round if necessary. Okay. Well, what, what I show there, and cannot show there, is not that high school graduation is, li is linked to migration. What I show there is that high school graduation is, li is linked to participation in transnational activities among migrants. That is, that the better prepared, the more educated are the, are, the, are the migrants more likely to join these activities. Not migration at the beginning, but once here, it is usually that is, of, we have completed an inventory of all Mexican Dominican and Colombian organizations in the country and know who are they, their participants. Overwhelmingly, they tend to be more educated, uh, sort of people with higher human capital. So, so I'm sorry for the confusion. So it's, what I had heard was that, was that high, the ones with high school education were more likely to emigrate. No, 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 they, no I didn't say at all that, that I did not talk about the origin. I, that is not necessarily, not necessarily. That is, uh, a, that would be about the origins of migration. What, the, what my data show is that among migrants here, these are the determinants of participation in these key activities. Um, concerning examples for, of infrastructure, they occur more uh, for professionals than for, than for labor migrants. That is, indeed, um, the case of China, that is the, the big um, uh, development poles, growth poles that have emerged in India, in uh, China, in Israel, and so on, have a lot to do with the creation by the government, the proactive creation by government of scientific technological facilities, in the protection of, lo of local industry and so on, to allow this to, this to happen. So in a sense, migrants, that is, those who emigrated have have a home, have something to return to, and have opportunities to which governments are receptive. At the level of labor migration, of sort of a, a low human capital manual workers, I see at present much less deliberate uh, government programs to do so. In, in a sense, uh, that is programs in sending country, uh, that is governments in sending, in the in sending countries have generally not uh, been very active in this field. And in the past, uh, when uh, the, improvements at the, the improvements at the local level actually were often financed by the migrants themselves. In other words, hometown committees here creating new public infrastructure, improving the quality of, the, of their town out of their investment and then returning when there was a migrant flow. But actually it was created by the initiative of migrants 
themselves. Uh, in, in a country like El Salvador, you can see a very clear distinction between, the home, between towns that have a committee of their expatriates abroad, that generally have paved street, a repair church, uh, an ambulance, a soccer field, and those that do not. But what, uh, what this proposal at the end of my talk would indicate is that governments have to get into the act, not only at the top but at the bottom, if they are going to, be, to re restore the possibility for cyclical migration and for, in a sense, migrants to want uh, to, want to return. They have to want to return to some, something that exists and that have developed uh, a, a, as in the past. The location of Mexico, uh, it's, I, don't, I, don't, I think that the location of Mexico, of course, is the primary factor for uh, Mexico becoming the great labor reservoir of the American economy. Uh, people today um, tend to make, tend to, in a sense, reify uh, the difference between, diff between distinct migrant communities. And since most, um, the, the, the levels of human capital among Asian immigrants, like Chinese and Indian immigrants today, tend to be very high, the reification is that these are successful, hardworking, and people on the up, whereas uh, in the case, of, in the case of, Mexi of Mexico, the overwhelming composition of this emigration is, is, has very low levels of education and training and so on, so that's the characteristic of Mexicans in general. Not at all. Not at all. Mexico, in terms of uh, average income per capita, is so it has a much higher income per capita than India, even today. Uh, it, that is, it's, the, it's a, in a sense, a, a contingent fact of geography. There is an ocean in the middle. So that, of course, Indian peasants and Chinese peasants would love dearly to cross a border. And sort of, and, and sort of uh, take advantage of higher wages and so on. But there is that ocean. So the ones who migrate are the professionals, the ones who can get the visas and so on. Mexico is right there. And it's impossible, erect the fence or not, to, to overcome the combined effects of very sus sustained labor demand on this side of the border, because that, that is increasingly necessary for agriculture, for construction, for services. No other source of labor exists to feed the, the needs of the labor-intensive sectors of the American economy. And the wish of these uh, peasants and workers to improve their lot and those of their families, given the large differentials. So in that sense, that's the, the significance of the, Mexico's location. At the professional level, let's take labor migration, the reason why Mexico has not until recently profited, as India and China and Israel have profited from their migrants abroad, is because it is a very lazy government and because it, by signing the North American Free Trade Agreement, in a sense, it, it depended on the market forces rather than be proactive in terms of creating these facilities. I'm glad to report that the situation is changing. That is, after, he, after seeing the success of India and China in terms of working with their professionals abroad, uh, certain segments of the Mexican federal state are moving in the direction of trying to build similar facilities and try to entice a, a large, the thousands of Mexican professionals who are here um, uh, to come back, and at least on, a, on this kind of back and forth flow as, uh, a, as happened before. This is something as recent as two years ago. And to answer Jorge's question, that's, that is, your, your question requires another lecture, or another, another talk, because it is, <laughs> it is like, what are we going to do, uh, what, what are we going to do in the future? I am in favor, and I think that my, my colleague, Massey, and others, we, I am in, free, in favor for, for um, I think that the, the flow at the, at the professional level is fine. The H-1B program works well, and the only thing that the sending countries' government have to do is follow the path of the successful countries, and they would benefit from the same flow. The problem is what to do with the manual labor flow that is crossing uh, illegally, uh, and that no fence is going to stop. Well, I think that the, the logical 
the logical way of doing this is to implement a temporary labor program um, uh, with uh, making it relatively easy and without a great bureaucratic requirements for migrants who have a job offer in the United States to come, not tying them to a particular employer to, in order to av av avoid the abuses of the old Bracero program. They could come and work for the people who offer their job for, say, three months, but then they would be free to leave. A temporary program of three years that can be extended for, or two or three years, that can be extended for another period. And, uh, and there would be, uh, uh, and then the question is, how do you get these migrants to return? Uh, that is, how do you, man that, how do you re preserve the cyclical flow? Uh, of labor that is ultimately to the benefit of both the sending and the receiving country. Let me, that is, uh, there are three points there, and without that end, first, actually there is a cyclical labor, there is a cyclical flow already in place, even for these migrants, but for, and this is for those who have acquired legal permanent residence in the United States. For many legal permanent residents or even citizens, they are doing the same as professionals. They are investing in homes in Mexico, they are planning to retire there, they go back and forth to visit families and so on because they can do it, they have the passport and they don't have any, a problem to do it. Well, the same thing, sh that is, why do the undocumented do not go back and forth instead bringing their families here? Because they have to pay $3,000 to hire a smuggler every time they cross. That's a rather expensive border crossing. So if you reduce that and you give them a permit to go back and forth, they'll go back and forth. That is exactly as, as it happened before the, the border became, uh, beca became uh, high, so highly enforced and, and before the flow was criminalized instead of being understood as a normal labor, um, labor program. Second, uh, the incent incentives to return can be created by, f by, for example, returning the fees that migrants would pay at the border in order to come. Say that they pay 2000 less than they pay today a coyote. When they are ready to return, that is, that is returned to them. And by returning their accumulated social security payments. They are not going to uh, live in this country, so why they, should they be penalized for that? So they, che they, they, they pay taxes, but the social security payment paid in a lump sum in a Mexican bank as Mexicans return become a, a very significant uh, voluntary economic incentive to return. To that should be added uh, the fact that any program like this should be a bilateral program, which that is every effort to reform American immigration in the past had been unilateral. That the United States decides what to do and the other countries and the other flows have to, in a sense, adapt. That's not going to happen. Mexico is unique among the um, on countries of out-migration. Ferris is right there. It has 2, 000, a 2,000 mile border with the United States. It's the place from which undocumented migration comes, not only from Mexicans, but from the rest of the world as well. So any program that works has to be a bilateral program between the governments of the US and Mexico and has to involve a commitment by Mexico to make investment in places, in, in sending areas, in, er, in, 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 send, in, in sending areas so that families can educate their children there so that there will be health facilities, so there will be access roads and so on, so that life, that is people will have something to return to. And that is nothing, that, that, should, that should be deliberately, this is a trade, this, is the, this would be the quid pro quo in exchange for, uh, for eliminating the continuation of having your nationals, your citizens, treated as a second, as a, as a caste here, and exploited and so on, and abused, we, in exchange for that, we are going to create a temporary labor program that allows them to come for a while, create incentives to return, you have to do your, your part of the, if that works, uh, we, would have, we would have transformed what is today a big problem and acute, that is, and, and, the, and that is the, the, uh, the, 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 the daily uh, a, ca fodder for xenophobes and nativists in CNN at, C, at six o'clock to into, <laughs> into what would be a regular, normal labor management program between two countries that are linked by reasons of economy and by reasons of history, um, and which should be, should, that in a flow like that 
can both benefit sending as well as receiving communities. One last round. Okay, one more round. No, one more, one more round. Over half of the immigrants to the United States today are female, and more than 50% of worldwide transnational migrants are also women. Um, it seems to me pretty clear that women are motivated differently from men in the incentives for return migration, and I would like to hear your comment on that. Mm -hmm. At the level of policy recommendation, is there any initiatives, bilateral initiative, to create some sort of welfare state program in Mexico by supported financially by some sort of American institution initiative? I'm thinking of the European Union and the programs such mm -hmm. as the structural funds and cohesion funds that really change the dynamics in my country, my home country, mm -hmm. Spain. Mm -hmm. Spain became a country of immigration mm -hmm. quite rapidly, and I think uh, there is something to say about the role of the European Union um, funding the development of, of Spain. But I don't know if that could be replicated or not in the context of US-Mexico, mm -hmm. but I definitely would love to hear what you have to uh, say. I see, yeah. Anyone else? Hmm? Okay. Well, both are big questions, and definitely um, it is true that the flow of the two, that is the, the composition of the 200 international migrants in the world today is increasingly feminized. Um, I think that the, the recommendations and the dynamics do not necessarily vary. I think that uh, generally I, women uh, usually come uh, for similar reasons. Uh, in the case of Latin America, uh, many come uh, leaving children behind in, the, in care of a family in order to uh, improve their, the, 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 the condition of their families, especially their children, through their work abroad. They are much more likely to be employed as domestics uh, in, in personal services, uh, often in prostitution rings. Uh, but they, that is, those long, that is a sing, single, f single migration of women tends to be migration of generally of young women who are following the same logic in terms of living to improve their lot, to improve their, their situation and try to improve that of their families, often, very often their children because they are mothers. In addition, of course, in the case of Mexico, migration has become feminized because of this, problem, this process of bottling up migration, that is, spouses come because since the primary migrants cannot go back, they bring in their families, so that increase also, uh, a, that increase female migration. So in that sense, uh, the, the, the dynamics of people that it works in both cases uh, in, with different sectors. Males usually here, um, I'm, I'm referring to migrant workers, tend to work in construction, and in agriculture, whereas females tend to veer uh, toward, uh, toward services and especially domestic service, which had become a big employer. Uh, the care of all people is, had become a major industry both in the United States and, and, and in Europe. So I think that, of course, uh, the, that is, there are particular nuances of, uh, of the flow of female migration that have to be taken care of, but the overall characteristics, the overall issue of, of, um, of improving the possibilities of return, the cyclicality of migration, the, the unification of families, and so on, uh, is, uh, is indeed uh, very important. There are uh, very poignant stories of uh, women migrant workers, both here and in, and in Europe, uh, 
paying for their families, that is paying with their remittances for the ra raising of their, or, of their children at home and finding that children are becoming more and more, they are becoming strange, uh, strangers to the children. That is that they, the children become more and more uh, distant from them. They only see the mother in Spain or here as a cash machine that be, as, they, as, they, as they grow, precisely because of the difficulty of maintaining circularity, of, of allowing the, the possibility of return temporary stays at home, at abroad rather than permanent ones. Uh, the last question, definitely uh, what, the, what Germany and France did for Southern Europe is very different from the approach of the United States toward Mexico. Uh, the Northern Europe, uh, in a sense, made a commitment to incorporate the southern periphery, uh, Greece, Spain, and Portugal, into the European Union and transfer enormous amounts of money to, to revamp the institutional infrastructure of those countries. In a sense, uh, certainly Spain was not developed by its migrants, it was to, but to a large extent it was developed by the rest of the European continent that came in, revamped the infrastructure, transformed them, and incorporated them into the that's very, very different from what the NAFTA uh, treaty uh, was about and did for Mexico because f to begin with, uh, the incorporation of Southern Europe into the European Union was accompanied by two things. The liber that is the freeing of all markets, <coughs> good markets, capital markets, and labor markets. <coughs> In the case of NAFTA, the freeing was of capital markets and good markets, but not the labor market. That is, the labor market was closed. That's an economic impossibility, which results that that is a direct, a direct cause of the 12 million illegal population in this country. And second, there was no significant transfer from the United States to Mexico in order to incorporate it in something called similar to the European Union. Uh, those involved in the NAFTA agreement made very clearly, made very clear in the negotiation that they were not going to engage in another Marshall Plan. They were not in the business of bringing Mexico into the first world. They were in the business of turning Mexico into a flexible labor reservoir. And this is indeed in what had happened with consequences that, are, uh, that we see and that are exactly contrary to the original preachings when the NAFTA agreement was being signed in 1992, that this agreement will, would reduce incentives for migration and reduce the flow of migration from Mexico. It had done exactly the opposite for, uh, for reasons that we can see uh, right now. Thanks.